I'm very glad to announce our next speaker, Dr. Katrin Preller. Katrin is a research group leader at the University of Zurich and an assistant professor at Yale University. Katrin Preller received her MSc in Neuropsychology from the University of Konstanz, Germany. And for a PhD, she went to the University of Zurich, Switzerland, where she investigated the neurobiology and social cog cognitive long-term effects of cocaine, MDMA, and heroin use. Afterwards, she joined the Neuropsychopharmacology and Brain Imaging Lab at the Psychiatric University Hospital in Zurich, investing psilocybin and LSD use using different types of brain imaging techniques. And she's going to talk today about the neurobiology of psychedelics, implications for psychedelic-assisted therapy. Welcome, Katrin. Thank you so much, Andrea, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you all for coming to Berlin. I'm super excited to be here with you today. Um, thank you so much. And also thanks, thank you to the organizers that you managed to get a lot more people than just the few of us here to also enjoy this conference via the online live stream. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, so I am going to talk um, today about the neurobiology of psychedelics. So, as you all know, uh, psychedelics induce very particular effects in, in humans. So, um, we, under the influence, we perceive the world and we perceive ourselves differently than we usually do. And there are two major reasons why this is interesting for science. First reason is that um, these substances can tell us a lot about how the brain works. The other reason, and this has already been mentioned um, in Henrik's talk, is that these substances may have a very broad clinical potential as well. So why the neurobiology and why do we think this is important? Well, I think um, the aim of all the people working in this field is to provide the best psychedelic assisted therapy possible. And for that, I think it is important to learn from what the neurobiology can tell us about how these substances work. Um, again, here, Henrik has already walked us through a bit of that. What could be the possible mechanisms of action? And there are quite a few, and none of them have been investigated enough to be sure what exactly it is that makes um, these, these substances therapeutically beneficial. So this is not a complete list um, that I'm going to show right now. Um, but there have been studies which showed alterations in the serotonin to A receptor system. Um, these substances have also been shown to induce neuroplasticity, at least in animal models. Um, they have been shown to decrease neuroinflammation. There are changes in epigenetics. There are alterations in brain networks. There are alterations in reward and emotion processing. Um, some patients report increased insight into dysfunctional behavior. And there are changes in how we perceive our social environment. Now, each of these possible mechanisms of action would warrant another half hour of a talk. So I won't have the time to go into every one of them, but I'll focus on, on these three here. And we'll try to relate that back onto what we can learn from these mechanisms for how we conduct psychedelic-assisted therapy. So, um, let's start at the beginning. What do psychedelics do in the brain? Well, first of all, when a psychedelic enters the brain, it stimulates receptors. And what happens then is that um, stimulating these receptors changes the way our, our neurons are active, how our neurons are firing. The serotonin 2A receptor is mainly excitatory receptor, so it increases the chances that these um, neurons become active. Now, that is of course dependent on where we are in our brain. So we find uh, serotonin 2A receptors all across the brain, but not to a similar degree. So in some areas there are more of these receptors, and in other areas there are fewer of them. Then of course it depends on the dose that someone was administered. 
and it depends on the exact substance that someone has taken, because all of these substances have slightly different receptor profiles. But of course, it doesn't end there. So when our neurons fire differently under the influence of a psychedelic, that also means that the way that information is, um, is transferred from one brain area to the other and therefore integrated will be different because our cells are, um, are active in a different way. So it changes the way information is processed across the brain. But of course, our brain is not an island. Our brain is interacting with our body and our body is interacting with the environment. So that also changes how we interact with our environment. And in the next few slides, I want to, uh, I want to walk you through some of the studies we have done to um, try to find out how psychedelics influence these different, different interaction ways. And I will start with, well, the brain itself, the brain in its usual resting state without interacting too much with, um, with the environment. So um, I've already kind of alluded to that a little bit. So our brain is not just a homogeneous mass, but we have brain areas which are pretty specialized. And the most important specialization that will become important for the next few slides is this one. So what you can see here are areas which are um, depicted in different colors. And these are our sensory brain regions. So these regions receive input from our environment. And then this information is transferred to the gray areas which integrate these, this information. So the gray areas are our association cortices. And it's important to keep this picture in mind because you will recognize it in all the other brain imaging pictures I will show in the next few slides. So we've talked about the cortex, but of course um, information processing in our brain doesn't start at the cortex. Usually what happens first is that we have these lower brain regions, um, like for example, the brainstem and the thalamus. So the thalamus is this big thing in the middle and information usually passes through the thalamus before it reaches the cortex for further processing. Now there's one prominent theory uh, in, in the field of psychedelics, um, which is called the thalamic filter model. And this theory suggested that um, the thalamus, which is usually filtering the information we receive from our environment, is not working quite that well under the influence of a psychedelic. So it leads to more information being processed in the cortex, which is expressed as a sensory overload and then leads to the psychedelic symptoms um, people under the influence are experiencing. We wanted to test this hypothesis with healthy human um, participants. And um, this is the first result. So these brain scans were collected under the influence of 100 microgram of LSD. And what we did here is we looked at the connectivity between the thalamus and the rest of the brain. And now if you remember back to the slide I showed in the beginning about the hierarchy of the cortex, you can easily distinguish two networks here. Um, one is in warm colors and the others are in, in the cool colors. And the warm colors are exactly these regions that I pointed out in the beginning, which are our sensory brain regions. And the blue ones are um, our associative brain regions. And what we see here is that the thalamus is indeed more strongly connected with um, our sensory brain regions, but less so with our associative brain regions. Now, as with all methods that we use in neuroscience, um, every method has its limitation. And the limitation with this method here is that we cannot say anything about directionality in this approach. Um, so we had to use another approach to really test this hypothesis, this theory, um, in terms of more information being sent to the cortex. 
Um, we used um, a method called dynamic causal modeling to do that. Again, this method also comes with its disadvantages, which means in this case that we cannot look at the whole brain um, when, we're when we're doing DCM analysis, at least for the time being. So we had to pick a few brain regions which were interesting um, for this theory. Um, so of, of course we, we picked the thalamus, we looked at, and then we looked at a few other cortical brain regions. And this is what we found. We found that indeed the thalamus does, is more strongly connected to some of the cortical brain regions, but less so to other cortical brain regions. So um, in particular, we see the um, posterior single led cortex here, a brain region which is often associated with our self-processing, how we perceive ourselves, for example. And um, here we see that indeed the thalamic filtering seems to be reduced, sending more information to the cortex for further processing. But how does this further processing now look like? Um, again, just a reminder um, to keep this image in, in mind. Um, again, our sensory brain regions versus our associative brain regions. And this is what we found when we looked at how the rest of the brain is connected. So how every part of the brain is connected with every other part of the brain. And again, you can see very clearly the same picture under the influence of LSD as well as under the influence of psilocybin. And what we see here is an increased connectivity between our sensory brain regions and at the same time, a decreased connectivity between our associative brain regions. Again, the warm and the cool colors in these pictures. Now, what does that mean? Well, it seems like, first of all, um, our thalamus is indeed not filtering information like it would usually do when we're not under the influence of a psychedelic, but it is sending more information to specific brain areas. And we've seen this increased connectivity with areas which are related to self-processing and also in particular our sensory brain regions. Now in the next step, we see this heightened sensory processing. So increased connectivity between um, sensory brain areas which is not counterbalanced by associative processing. So we've seen that our associative brain regions are not as integrated as they usually are. And I think that this can explain the different symptoms, the different subjective effects. We have heightened sensory processing, but the way we integrate this information is different. So this could explain, for example, the visual alterations that people are experiencing, but it could also have a clinical application because if we integrate information about ourselves and the world differently, it might help patients to get to break out of, out of rigid thinking patterns um, to find new ways of how to think about themselves, to find, uh, find new ways to think about the world and get rid, of, um, get rid of maladaptive thinking patterns that they are often suffering from. So I want to spend um, two more minutes on um, the, the resting state brain imaging, so the general effects of psychedelics on, um, on the brain. So what we did in our study with psilocybin is we also looked at the effects of psilocybin over time. So we scanned our participants uh, 20 minutes, which is the first panel, 20 minutes after administration, then a second time 40 minutes after administration, and a third time 70 minutes after administration. And what you can see here is that this pattern of increased connectivity in sensory brain regions and decreased connectivity in associative brain regions is emerging over time. At 20 minutes, we see predominantly increased connectivity in our visual brain areas, um, but this pattern of decreased connectivity in our, in our associative brain regions is already emerging at 40 minutes, and then we have the full-blown pattern at 70 minutes. 
But of course, for clinical um, effects, not only the acute effects are interesting, also the long-term effects are important. And this is a study by colleagues <coughs> from Johns Hopkins uh, University. And they have looked at changes in brain connectivity um, post-acutely. So one week and one month after administration of psilocybin. And what you can see here is that indeed there are lasting effects on um, changes in brain connectivity. So um, that are even significant one month after, um, after administration. However, they are not quite as consistent as we would think. So you can see there are differences happening between one week and one month. So we don't quite yet know what exactly this means. Another result that I quickly want to point out is that we also looked at um, how um, the functional architecture of our brain, when it's not under the influence of, psych of a psychedelic, is related to the changes induced by, in this case, psilocybin. And we did find a correlation between the organization of the brain when it's just in its usual state and the magnitude of induced effects of, um, under the influence of a psychedelic, which could mean that, well, we know that people respond differently to a psychedelic, and the way our brain is organized might have something to do with that to explain this variance between the effects between people. And I want to bring this part full circle by coming back to the receptor level um, we used in these in um, the study where we administered LSD, we used a second substance called cadanserin, which blocks the serotonin to A receptor. And what we've seen here is that when we block the serotonin to A receptor before we administer LSD, we basically don't get any effects anymore. The reason why I'm showing you LSD versus uh, placebo and LSD versus cadanserin plus LSD is, well, first of all, you can already see, you don't even need statistics, you can already see that this looks very, very similar. And if I show you cadanserin plus LSD versus placebo, it would be a very boring picture because it's just a gray brain. So we don't see any differences in brain connectivity um, when we block the serotonin to A receptor, telling us that the serotonin to A receptor, at least at this dose, is, um, is involved and is responsible for um, the eff effects by um, LSD. We also used another method um, to verify this result where we looked at the receptor gene expression, so where are these receptors located in the brain, and correlated this with um, these changes induced by LSD. And we saw um, that the location of the receptors um, strongly correlates with, um, or the density of the receptors in, in brain areas strongly correlates with um, these changes induced in functional connectivity. Again, telling us that the serotonin 2A receptor is important, is necessary for um, psychedelics to induce these effects. So what does that mean now for um, psychedelic assisted therapy? Well, we've already talked about, um, well, these, that the state that people are in under the influence of a psychedelic might open up new perspective, might give us the opportunity to integrate information differently, finding new ways, breaking free from rigid thinking patterns. And therapists can support this process they can actively engage with the patient to find these new perspectives, to find new solutions. However, as always, many, many open questions remain. And one is, well, what's the best timing? What is the best dose for this um, breakdown of rigid thinking patterns? We have seen that even at a very early time during the, during the subjective effects, 40 minutes um, after, administration. We already see this disintegration in associative brain regions. That could mean that even a lower dose might be enough to induce this effect and to help patients to, to um, break out of rigid thinking patterns. This also raises the question, well, should we then interfere with the 
um, with the acute experience. Um, in most studies, people are, or therapists are not necessarily interfering with the experience, but people are just lying there, listening to music, maybe wearing eye shields. Um, but if we indeed want to leverage this effect and we don't know how long it lasts, maybe we should interfere with the acute experience. And of course, is the, long, is the, is the lasting effect, the long-term effect, more important, or is it really the acute effect that we need to leverage to, to help our patients? And last but not least, um, maybe we do have a stratifying factor. Maybe we can predict from the connectivity of people's brains without any substance whether they will benefit from the therapy or not. And this would be um, this would indeed be a revolution in psychiatry because in psychiatry we currently do not have these biomarkers, these predictive stratifying factors, but maybe there is something here for psychedelics. So let's switch from um, just looking at the brain to looking how the brain interacts with its environment um, under the influence of a psychedelic. So. Um, a lot of studies have by now replicated one specific effect of psychedelics. And that is that psychedelics reduce the processing of negative information. And we've seen that in behavioral tests um, where people have difficulties recognizing negative emotions under the influence of a psychedelic. And we've also seen that in, when we did brain scans where the amygdala or our emotional center of the brain is less reactive to negative stimuli. Um, we've also seen that even on a very, on a minor dose of, uh, of a psychedelic, so this was 13 micrograms of LSD, um, that there are changes in the connectivity between the amygdala, so our emotional center, and the prefrontal cortex, our more controlling center, and that these changes in connectivity are associated with changes in mood induced by um, this tiny dose of LSD. But again, what are the long-term effects? Because we want people to get better in the long term. So again, a study by um, the group at Johns Hopkins. Um, this group has shown that um, indeed this decreased amygdala reactivity has a lasting impact at least for a week. It goes back to normal though after about a month. Um, but then um, there's another study which was conducted in depressed patients. And um, this is a study from Imperial College London and they scanned the depressed patients right the morning after the experience. And they have shown quite the opposite result. They have shown that the morning after the experience, the amygdala is actually more reactive. So again, what does that mean for uh, psychedelic assisted therapy? Well, first of all, um, being less reactive towards negative stimuli might open up a window of opportunity to process negative life events. However, as before, many open questions remain. So should we confront patients with negative life events? And if yes, when? Um, and the other question is, um, well, is integration therapy necessary to achieve these long-term improvements in emotion processing? As we have seen um, that Psych that patients or the amygdala of patients is even more reactive the morning after the experience. That means to achieve this effect of um, long-term reduced um, reactivity to negative stimuli, we probably need to do something. Um, and this brings me to the next question. Do we need to provide additional support during the post-acute effects? Because if, if patients are indeed more reactive towards emotions and emotional stimuli, then um, we can, we, we should consider that, we should take this into account and provide the support for them to navigate the situation. But again, long-term effects in clinical populations are unclear and we need to find out how this emotional reactivity develops over time in patients. 
And this brings me to the last part of the talk. Um, so of course we do not only um, interact with our physical environment, we also interact with our social environment. And as I've already shown, we, we have seen in, in a number of studies by now, less reactivity towards negative um, stimuli. But what does that mean for social interaction? And in particular, in psychiatric patients, we know that they experience a lot of negative social interactions. They experience a lot of social rejection. And we also know that they are often more reactive towards social exclusion, towards social um, rejection. Now, what we did here is we um, had our participants under the influence of um, psilocybin and asked them to play a game in the scanner. And it worked that way that um, before our participant went into the scanner, um, they met Michael and they met Sarah. And, um, and while they were lying in the scanner, they could play a game with them. So they could throw a ball to either Michael or Sarah. And of course, Michael and Sarah could do the same. Um, but at some point during this game, Michael and Sarah just stopped playing with our participant. They excluded them from the game. And um, it is a really fascinating paradigm because it has been done um, and replicated quite a few times, not necessarily with psilocybin, but in general. And it induces a strong feeling of social rejection, even though these are probably not your best friends, but every single participant usually comes out of the scanner and is like, wow, that was really, really mean. And um, the beauty of this paradigm is, as I said, it's been replicated um, many times and it induces reliably this, um, this increased bolt signal, this activation of the anterior cingulate cortex um, when participants are excluded. And as I said before, um, this has also been done in patient populations, and we've seen that, for example, borderline personality disorder patients react more strongly to this social exclusion. Now, what happens under the influence of psilocybin? Well, first of all, um, we, of course, asked our participants. And we asked them a lot of questions to make sure that they were indeed aware that they were being excluded. I mean, after all, they had taken psilocybin. Um, so we, we asked, like, can you guess how many times you received the ball and all these types of control questions. And all of them, none of them was changed in any way. So they knew perfectly well that they were being excluded from the game. But the, the, um, the emotional exclusion range, so when we asked them, like, how strongly did you feel excluded? Then this was significantly lower under the influence of psilocybin than um, placebo. And also, when we look at our fMRI results, we see decreases in, um, in the reactivity of the anterior cingulate cortex under the influence of psilocybin versus placebo. Another and uh, last result that I want to show you, we also tested if participants um, felt more empathetic under the influence of psilocybin. And indeed, when we're looking at emotional empathy, empathy, so how much do our participants feel with other people, we do see increases in emotional empathy. And that has been replicated quite a few times by now too. We do not see any changes in cognitive empathy. So cognitive empathy means how well can you identify the emotion that someone else is expressing. Um, that doesn't seem to be changed acutely. And also, we don't see any significant, significant differences in moral decision-making. Again, these are acute effects. Maybe um, we cannot change them acutely. They might be something that is changed post-acutely, but this is something that we still need to test. So, um, again, the implications for psychedelic-assisted therapy. So, it seems like psychedelics 
open a window of opportunity to reconnect with um, the social environment. And that is particularly important because we know that psychiatric patients often feel very disconnected from their social environment. I've only shown a few results here. There are many more um, which describe the, um, the impact of psychedelics on social processing. If you're interested in that, you'll find an overview in one of the papers we've published two years ago. Um, but again, more questions than answers. So um, what does this mean for the patient-therapist relationship? Um, do psychedelics change the patient-therapist relationship? And is that maybe um, an opportunity to um, well, turn the, the therapeutic process into something even more beneficial? Um, maybe group sessions might have an additional beneficial effect. Um, and it raises the question whether we should include family members or loved ones in the therapeutic process. But again here, we just need more data. We need more data on the long-term effects in particular, um, and we need data in clinical populations. So to wrap this up, um, what we have seen is that psychedelic-assisted therapy, by definition, is an interaction between pharmacological and non-pharmacological mechanisms. We have seen that therapists can potentially support finding these new perspectives, breaking free from rigid thinking patterns. We might have an opportunity here for processing negative life events. We have an opportunity for reconnecting with the social environment. And we might even have a stratifying biomarker that tells us before we even administer the substance whether someone might benefit from the therapy or not. But as I've also shown, there are many, many, many open questions that still need to be answered. And I can only encourage everyone to take them seriously, to take the implications seriously that neurobiology has on how we conduct the therapy to um, reach this aim that I think we all share to provide the best, um, to provide the patients with the best psychedelic assisted therapy possible. And with that, I want to thank everyone involved in these studies and of course you here in Berlin and the online audience for listening. Hello everyone, we are in the speaker's corner for Dr. Prello. She's a senior researcher, psychologist, neuroscience, she does it all. Um, so from University of Zurich and Yale University, she has just done a wonderful talk and now we have about 80 people joining us for a personal speaker's corner. So we would ask you to use the Q&A question and answer function in AirMeet, and then we can spotlight your questions and hopefully get them answered. Hi, everyone. Okay, we got the first question, and I will, uh, Saskia, I'm going to put you on stage, okay? So it says, can you say something about the extent to which cytochrome P450 enzymes play a role in the metabolism of the various psychedelics you have examined, and about the extent to which genetic variants affect pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic processes? Got yeah, to start easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Saskia, thank you so much for this question. And I'm sorry, I will not be able to really answer them for two reasons. Um, the first is that um, we have very little information on genetic variants um, in the effects of psychedelics in general. Um, we are trying to answer these genetic questions. Um, and, and I think a lot of studies are doing right now. But for the time being, um, there's really very little data, um, at least in humans. And in terms of enzymes, I just cannot provide you with the answer because I'm not an expert on, on metabol uh, metabolic pathways. But I'm sure there will be talks in, uh, during this conference that will cover that and who will hopefully be able to answer your question. <laughs> 
Thank you so much for your answer. And we also have a second question coming up. So we will, Cairo says, is there any data on whether size and length of therapeutic benefit is influenced by supplemental changes to an individual's personal environment or if the effect, lar or if the effect is largely independent? Yeah, incredibly good question. Um, so I would, I mean, I, my, my guess is yes. Um, so for me, it only makes sense that, you know, the, the, the therapeutic effects in, effect interacts with the environment. However, again, we do not have any data on that quite yet. So most of the studies that have been um, that have been conducted right now are really small studies um, in, in which have not investigated any um, well or few mechanistic effects and also very few effects in terms of um, yeah personal environment and changes to a personal environment. So this is this is one of the very important unanswered questions. Uh, at this point, which I hope we'll be able to um, to investigate once we have more and larger studies. Thank you again for the eloquent answer. And we have another one from a student. And they say, are long-term long effects caused by the new perspective in the active stage of the psychedelic therapy, or is it caused more by the actual changes in the connectivity in the brain caused by drugs? I, I really love these questions um, because, uh, uh, but unfortunately, again, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer them, them but I love them because you're really asking the hard questions and exactly the questions that neuroscience and therapeutic science and medicine needs to answer in, uh, in the future and hopefully in the very near future. Because um, we, we don't know at this point. A lot of so studies that have been conducted um, now have only focused on whether people are getting better or not, or if it's safe or not to administer these substances to clinical populations. But very few studies have actually tried to answer the question why or what makes it effective and um, what causes these beneficial effects. And we're really actively trying to fill this knowledge gap but of course it takes it takes a little bit of time to answer these questions um, but I hope I will have more answers in the near future. Thank you and we also have a question from another one of our insight speakers Stephen Asma so let's see if we can even invite him to the stage if he would like to join at all. So Stephen, I've just sent you an invite if you would like to say your question aloud. Hello. All right, he's connected. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, hi. Thank you for a wonderful talk, uh, Catherine. That was uh, excellent. Um, my question is just, uh, you know, I, I come out of the philosophy of science uh, tradition, and some of this is a sort of vocabulary um, question. When you were describing the way in which, according to this uh, thalamus filter model, the sensory uh, cortices were activated, but the associational areas were not, is that basically another way of saying that the default mode network is more active, or is this a different sort of finding? Yeah, um, that is, in a way, a different sort of finding, um, but I might have to clarify a little bit of um, what I presented in that talk. So what we have done is we were not looking at activity. We were looking at connectivity. That means how synchronous um, these brain areas are. So they might be very active, but still not in sync. Uh -huh. um, and that would be reflected in decreased connectivity. Um, and with a decreased connectivity, we think that there is a lower capacity for integration to work. You know, usually if they if, if things are synchronized, then, you know, they, they work together. Um, so that and most of the findings that we have seen um, in brain imaging and with psychedelics is uh, are based on connectivity, not on on activity necessarily, at least in um, resting state. Now, when it comes to activity in these associative brain regions and the default mode network is indeed 
um, a, a part of these associative brain regions. We need to make a difference between whether we are looking at the brain in you know, its resting state, so we're not stimulating it with any input, or if we are um, target, if, if we're doing something, if you're playing music, if you're giving people a task. So that is, that is a very different mode for the brain. And because we're, if you're seeing deactivation or, you know, um, hypoactivation during um, resting state does not mean that if, you know, if the brain is interacting with something that, you know, we cannot see um, activation, even though people are on the same substance. So it is, it, it is indeed complicated, but we need to make sure that we're not mixing activation with synchronization here. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, thank you too, and thank you for coming on stage. Uh, the next question that has a few upvotes now is, uh, let's see, from Salem, how does the thermalis affect the default mode network under psychedelics? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this question. Um, so in the studies that we have seen, um, we have seen that the thalamus is, you know, more strongly interacting with the sensory brain areas, less so with um, these associative brain regions. And um, the default mode network is part of these associative brain regions. So um, it seems like there is indeed, um, there is indeed, lower connectivity or lower interaction between the thalamus and the default mode network in general. But the default mode network is a very, very large network that covers really large parts of our brain. So um, there might be areas which are specific or which are different. And also it depends, again, um, related to the previous question, it depends a little bit on what conditions, right? So here we're mainly talking about resting state, so no external input. Things might be different if we stimulate our participant with a specific task, for example, and that is always something to keep in mind. It's unfortunately, the effects of psychedelics are unfortunately more complex than can be explained by, you know, just deactivation of a specific network, for example. Thank you so much for your answer again. And then yeah, ooh, we have another hot rising answer I'm going to show on stage. Let's see. How close are we to accurately predicting res uh, response responsivity to psychedelic treatment from non-invasive measures? Increasingly, companies are claiming they can. So very, very critical of it. Um, I think we're... We're, so I, I do think we are very far from that. Um, we have we don't have the sample sizes in the studies um, that allow us to make um, to really make a claim about that, and um, therefore therefore I, I really don't think we are um, we we are close to being able to to predict that. I, but I do think that we have some promising results right now, but they have not been tested in clinical populations. And um, so, yeah, we, we'll, we'll see if the results that we have seen in, in healthy participants actually translate to clinical populations. And if, you know, the, the effects we're seeing actually have something to do with the clinical mechanism of action, which is another question that we don't know right now. So there are, I think, quite a few open questions that we need to answer before we can claim that we can actually predict um, uh, treatment efficacy from non-invasive or baseline data. Yes, thank you. And then we have more of a general question that has also become a little popular. So how long do the effects of psilocybin last after administration of therapy? Longer than a month? Yeah. So the studies that we that have been conducted and have been published so far show that um, most of the patients benefit for about three to six months. Um, that being said, um, most of the studies have not followed up with these patients uh, much longer than just six months. So there might be patients who benefit even longer than that. But we also see in these published studies that um, there is, you know, a significant um, 
proportion proportion of pa patients who do relapse um, after three to six months. So there might be some variability here and there might be some people who benefit for a longer term and some other people don't. And this is also, I think it's a very, very important question because again, we need to find out where this variability comes from and how we can support longer lasting effects. Thank you. That's a Nice positive outlook for the future too, right? All right. So we will be shortly wrapping up. I think we can do a couple more questions if that's okay with Dr. Prella. Sure. Beautiful. And we have, just curious if all the data you showed is only acute dosage. If yes, have you looked at prolonged usage? Yeah. So the data I showed um, which, uh, on, on the studies we have conducted in, um, in Zurich. So these data were all acute, um, but I have shown a few studies um, mainly from Johns Hopkins uh, University who have looked at prolonged effects. Um, but yeah, the, the, so, so far we have a lot more studies on the acute effects and very little research on the longer term effects. Um, but we are trying to fill this knowledge gap now, especially also in our clinical trials where we're looking at, um, changes in brain connectivity, um, for about one month after, um, after psilocybin treatment. So we're actively trying to fill that knowledge gap. But yes, at the moment, we have very little data on the long-term effects, unfortunately. Thank you. And I believe the last question for the night we will take, it's hard to imagine how a short trip that causes a change in connectivity may be enough to make someone think differently about the world or him or herself. Is it explained by the strength of these changes? Are they in like any other natural phenomena? So I will have to read through that question one more no time. Worries. <laughs> it's more um, it's, it's very general. So I think a nice way to end mm -hmm. the Q&A. <laughs> um, yeah, it's um, again, you know, a very fascinating question. And I think um, exactly the reason why these um, substances are so fascinating for many people, because um, a pretty short experience can have a lasting effect that um, is much, much longer than the acute experience. And exactly this is what our research is trying to answer. Like, why? Why does that happen? Um, and, and, Again, you know, I, I cannot really give you the answers quite yet. We're, we're really trying to find out what it is that makes these um, these experiences special. Is it the the experience itself? Is it something that has to do with um, changes in the biology of the brain? Um, we know that there are some um, well, some not pharmacologically induced experiences which can also have a very long lasting. Um, impact on on people's lives, be it, for example, the birth of a child. Um, on the negative side, of course, also traumatic events, which you know change um, the way you perceive some yourself and the environment. Um, uh, can influence that for for um, sometimes the rest of your life. Um, but we don't really know what it is that um, makes psychedelics have these very long lasting effects. But yeah, hopefully, you know, when we meet the next time, um, I'll be able to give you more answers on that. <laughs> yes, and thank you so much again for your time. Thank you everyone who asked questions and over 100 people here. So thank you so much. It's really an honor. And it's thank you, Dr. Katrine Prella. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for joining. Yes. Take care, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye.